we'll start off with whatever this is. And it looks to be 10 LED breakout boards with eight LEDs each. It says this is blue LEDs and common ground, so common cathode. I figured often enough I need LEDs and I do have some other breakout boards with LEDs, switches, potentiometers. I have another one with addressable LEDs, but sometimes you just need something smaller, more dedicated, and a lot more LEDs available if you need a whole bunch. So common is the first terminal. And I'm assuming these are current limit resistors. I'm not sure what kind of voltage this is meant for. Those packages say 202, so 2K. And 1.94K, that's close enough to 2K. So I'll give it 5 volts. Common is ground. And there's the blue LED. And they're all working. So now I've got some LEDs readily available. This package has been sitting here a while. I don't know what it is. There was no tracking number on it. it. Looks like diodes. And Zener diode surface mount. So this must have been just some sort of restocking. So they're both Zeners. 1206 surface mount package. 3 volts up to 24 volts and 1 in 4148. And this one says 600 pieces, 2 volt up to 39 volt half watt Zener kit. This was probably one of those things where I needed to add something to the cart to make minimum shipping or minimum number of items to be ordered at once or something like that. And another one where I can't tell what it is until I open it. These are items I've had laying around longer. Usually the ones I've ordered recently, I know what came in, but this is several months ago. Some sort of cable. It looks like a D sub nine with bare wire ends tinned. It looks like it has all nine wires, not just a couple. So most likely what I was thinking with this, since this is the kind of joystick unofficial standard connector style in the old game systems like Atari 2600, Coleco, and some other consoles or home computers, if I wanted to make some sort of interface and plug a circuit into the joystick port on one of those systems, this is one way to hook it up. I know this was a choice delivery thing where the parts were cheaper, so I just added a bunch of things to the cart. Well, we got 30 pieces of 40 pin headers in different colors. I think I just got this because I'm always using headers and eventually I'm going to run out. So if they popped up in one of those extra discount sale things. It's always a good time to stock up on consumable parts. They are certainly well packaged. I don't understand. How do you take this apart? It's a good thing I don't unbox things for a living. There it is. So I don't care what color they are, but the price was right at the time. What I do care to check, I'll just break off a small section so it goes in a breadboard easier. I think these are small enough to fit. Some headers are way too big for a breadboard. That just went on in no problem. These will be good for breadboard modules. Then there's these multicolor long nib markers. Three red, three blue, three black. So those are used to get into spaces where you may not be able to directly reach. You gotta go down in through some hole that's cut when you're drilling something or whatever. So as long as this is working, yeah, it's got ink in it. That was one thought I had. Are these gonna be all dried out when I get them? So if you need to go 
into a weird space and be able to put a mark somewhere else. This can be useful. And there's these other long nib markers. So again, there we are. So if we need to make an obvious mark when working on stuff, maybe with metal enclosures when they're going to be drilled or something, it's got a relatively fine point on it as well. So sometimes a regular marker just isn't the best thing. So these should come in useful. Like when I need to make some markings on a, an enclosure like this and do some drilling. So good to have. And solid mechanical carpenter pencils is what this says. I think somehow the AliExpress algorithm saw that I was looking at writing utensils and then they put a bunch on sale and marketed it to me successfully. So none of these leads were broken. That's good. They're in a hard case. Oh, it's already got a lead in it. Okay. And it works. And I need some extra space to open up this Amazon package. There's a couple of things I had in my shopping cart. As usual, I've always got some low-cost guitar effects in the shopping cart. So this is some sort of a distortion effect. It has volume tone gain. Right now it's off. So as usual, just testing to see that it even works. So that can at least provide distortion, whether or not it's good in a practical setting with a bigger amplifier. I'll find out in the future. So now I gotta start clearing stuff away. I'm gonna take things out of the way to make room ultimately for this. And while we're here, I got these two cutting mats, A4 and A5 size. And there's different ones available. These are the thicker ones, like the big one I use, because it makes them more rigid. There's thinner ones that are basically no structural support. And the reason I wanted a couple of these small ones, often I'm working on some stuff and there may be DuPont wires going all over the place, possibly a USB cable. I'm here at the workbench doing stuff, but then I might need to update software, which usually I'm doing in a different area altogether. So if I'm working on one of these smaller mats, I can just pick this up now and go wherever I need to go and having a couple of different sizes can make it more practical. So this comes in useful, for example, when I'm working on the old game systems and I'm making a circuit to interface. I've already got another cutting mat in use over in the Atari 2600 and TurboGrafx-16 area. So now I have more options and now that I know this specific mat is useful and it's rigid, maybe I'll get a couple more. And finally, we have this tin lead melting pot. This is one of the larger diameter ones. The opening is 10 centimeters. You can get them five centimeters or even just a couple of centimeters, which is useful because if you're only using it to tin the ends on wires, this is overkill and it's gonna have a lot more material in there that you have to heat up and maintain. So one of those much smaller pots is useful for that. But I wanted the larger one because I wanted to try a couple of things, including whether I want to try connecting parts or even removing awkward through-hole parts. If I can find a safe way to lower this down, that could be useful. So I thought I would try this out. The unit's construction, of course, is sort of flimsy, like this bottom on here is barely like aluminum foil. It's not solid together. I think it's more rigid here at least. So 
I'm going to be definitely laying this on top of some other metal substrate because I don't know how hot this is going to get. Plus, if anything goes weird, I don't want any molten metal going onto some other surface. And of course, one of the first things I'm wondering, is this thing grounded? Well, that's a good sign. The mounting screws are grounded. I can't really get at any exposed metal with this painted enclosure, but the screws are going through there anyway, so I'll figure that's okay. Reaching inside the bottom of the pot. I'm not going to do a teardown right now. I'd rather see if it works because there's not much to it. So as long as it seems grounded, we have an on off switch and a temperature control from 200 Celsius to 480. So I'm curious to just power this up and see what happens. So now I've got this old computer tower case, so this can sit on it on the workbench. And I have this bar of 60, 40 tin lead. I cut a few pieces off of it with a hacksaw. You can see here it's twisted. I would score it a little bit and then just take big channel locks, clamp it into a vise, and just twist it and it comes right apart. Here goes nothing. So I'm gonna put the temperature up maybe halfway, and if this does melt properly, I have a few things I want to try. So I have this old DuPont wire where the end is stripped bare, so it's copper colored right now. I think what you're supposed to generally do is not use a flux based product in the pot, but you're supposed to maybe dip this in flux before you dip it in the pot. And I do have some flux, various types, so that'll be on hand. I'm going to move things around in case there's certain hot spots somewhere and it will make it go quicker. Oh, it's starting to melt on the side of the container. There it goes. So if I can just get it started, it might cause a thermal bridge and allow it to all melt better. I'm turning the temperature up to see if I can get it going. It's been about 17 minutes. While that's melting, maybe I'll try tinning this wire. I'm putting it in the flux, so I just dipped it in there. Of course, the pot is not very deep because it's broader diameter, so it's definitely obviously tinned. Of course, I'm doing this at a distance. I can't really see what I'm doing when I'm putting it in that pot. And as a little experiment, I've got this connector board. I put capped on tape where I don't want anything to stick. I'm going to try putting this switch on here. And the holes are a good enough fit that this will stay on there. And I have this on some long pliers. I wonder if this will work. I tried to put some flux on there with one of those flux pens. Yep, there's the smoke. So the fit wasn't tight enough to keep this flat. I should have probably used more capped on tape to just brace this down. Also, I probably hit it on one of the edges when I dunked it in there, probably knocked it out of place. But all things considered, the side that's still in the board looks like it might be an okay job. Obviously down here where it was moving around it didn't do so great. But the capped on tape kept this area clean. I'm not sure if that's all flux there making it look bubbly that I could just clean off. I don't think I'd be trying to reflow like this but more importantly if I wanted to remove a part with a lot of through holes that it's hard to manually do. But it looks like this is working. I'm gonna turn the temperature all the way down and turn it off. And we're supposed to take some sort of a piece of metal, like a scraper or whatever, and get rid of the, I believe it's dross, <laughs> all of the oxidized stuff on the top. We're supposed to skim it aside when we're ready to use it again, just like cleaning the tip of an iron. But for a first ever attempt, that went okay. 
and not much smoke at all, only when I put flux in there. So using the proper bar of tin lead is the way to go, and I'll have to let that cool down now. And I should probably just drop this final piece in there because it's only barely covering the bottom as is. So that'll just solidify in place and be ready for the next time I use it. Now this has cooled down sufficiently. And there's all the stuff from today. Now that I know this melting pot works, I may want to take the bottom off and look inside and just see how this is all structured, because this is a little bit wobbly. Not loose, but more like it's easy to bend. So if this gets some sort of a torque on it, I just want to see how it's put together inside and make sure nothing's about to fall apart. These new cutting mats are going to be useful for moving projects around between a work area and a computer Arduino software work area. More low-cost guitar effects to help research and development for coming up with some of my own. A lot of long nib markers, another bunch of headers to get me through many more projects and miscellaneous parts. Thanks to supporters of the channel for helping make all this possible.